close. Section 144 BBA, uh, where processing officer is supposed to make a reference to principal CID uh, or uh, uh, CIT appeal or uh, GAP uh, approving panel. Uh, there is a hierarchy of reporting. First, the assessing officer has to report to the principal CID or CID as the case may be. And then with their approval, uh, the reference will be made to the GAR uh, approving panel. And then the GAR approval panel will be con comprised of you know, experts and uh, representatives from various fields. And then once the GAR approving panel uh, declares a particular arrangement as an impermissible arrangement, it will be considered as a uh, impermissible awareness arrangement and all the consequences under the act would follow. Here, section 92, 2A and 90A, uh, integrated 2A, GAR overrides tax treaties. So, uh, notwithstanding tax treaty, GAR would prevail. We have section 245 and A4, application of advanced ruling on the applicability of GAR. 253 1E direct appeal before the ITAT against the assessment orders is GAR cases. We, uh, one can bypass the, you know, uh, uh, no need to go to, you know, other forums or uh, other panel. Then section 144C, 14 and no reference to dispute resolution panel. That is what we can bypass, you know, in case of a GAR. Uh, no need to go to DRP. We can directly go to the ITAT. Now, this is just for your information, uh, not uh, really, uh, you know, need to remember. The GAR roadmap, close 30C applicability, it started, all started with 16th March 2012. When the first time in the finance bill, the concept of GAR was introduced. And uh, then uh, June 12, draft uh, GAR guidelines by the government of India were framed. 13 July, expert committee on GAR was constituted. 1st September, GAR committee's report was published. 14th May 2019, closed 30, kept in abeyance till 33, 2020. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, before that, 14th March 2013, GAR was postponed for two years. Uh, it was discussed, widely discussed and deliberated, and it was, uh, you know, uh, decided that India is not yet ready for the such a wide uh, you know provisions then again uh, gar was deferred for one more year 2000 up to 2017 and uh, the reporting part though gar was made applicable from 1 for 2017 the reporting under the tax audit was deferred by till 30 uh, one, uh, 31st march 2019 and again 2020 again 2021 and now uh, for from uh, 31st March 2020, uh, or rather 1st uh, April 2022, the reporting has been now brought in under the tax audit. So it has the reporting has been uh, you know postponed for a number of times, number of years, but now it is uh, made uh, you know uh, compulsory to report under the tax audit, and that is why we are learning this uh, provision. Now chapter 10, as I said, you know. Uh, uh, so rule 10 says that chapter 10, that is a chapter on guard. Now, why we are discussing about the guard? The reason is that the clause, uh, you see, as it is worded, it says that whether the assessee has entered into an impermissible avoidance arrangement as referred to in section 96 and which takes us to the general anti avoidance Now, the, remember the clause 30A, 30B, and 30C. 30A deals with the transfer pricing. 30B deals with the inadmissibility of certain interest expenses. Uh, and the 30C deals with this reporting about the impermissible avoidance arrangement. These are all part of the anti avoidance provisions. And therefore, a tax auditor now is supposed to know uh, you not know, the transfer pricing because under the transfer pricing all clause also, you need to know whether the primary adjustment is being done, whether the secondary adjustment is done whether the you know uh, the uh, remittance is being brought in because of the secondary adjustment and host of other issues similarly in inadmissibility of you know interest expenses in respect of the related party transactions again one need to know the cross border transactions the mechanism and how it works so uh, again tax treaty implications and other host of other issues 
uh, the tax auditor is supposed to know before reporting. One of the biggest problem with the tax audit itself is that uh, you know it asks us to uh, certify is a true and cert correct, and that is where uh, you know I have apprehension uh, because number one transfer pricing you can't uh, you know uh, correct as a you know certify as a correctness because it ultimately it's an opinion. Similarly, uh, even the impermissible avoidance arrangement. Uh, is also in the nature of an opinion. In fact, at one place, guidance code also made a reference that ultimately it is an opinion. We'll see, you know, uh, how uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, report this transaction or how we can uh, put a relevant disclaimer. Then we have a, a 10 rule 10 UA determination of consequences of IA, 10 UB notice and forms of reference under section 144 BA. And then you see time limit for various stages of assessment procedure in car case. These rules are very, very important because these are the actual implementation mechanism. So if we look at SAR, what is SAR? It's a specific anti-avoidance rules. So we have a number of specific anti-avoidance rules under the income tax laws. Okay. And this is just for your information, you know, that how income tax department or income tax laws in India are becoming very stringent and it is not advisable or it is virtually impossible now, you know, for a taxpayer to enter into any dubious or any, uh, uh, you know, transactions for tax uh, evasion, I would say. Tax information exchange agreement, section 90 and 90A. So we have a very seamless exchange of information coming in day in and day out if we read in the newspaper about the uh, in the exchange of information. These are all beyond the leaks, which are already there. These leaks are uh, not in the official uh, uh, manner, but these are the official exchange. And through that, you know, those lot of 148 notices were issued. Uh, Non-residents were uh, also issued notices. This incentive for transactions with persons under a notified jurisdiction area. We had a recent classic case of Cyprus, which was notified as a notify uh, jurisdiction and of course later on after they comply with certain uh, requirement uh, it was taken out of that section 94a we have thin capitalization section 94b just, i made just our uh, reference uh, close 30b deals with this particular uh, you know uh, reporting requirement we have a poem uh, place of effective management in respect of overseas investment uh, which deals uh, section 63 and 115 h deals with this uh, concept and we have transfer pricing provision section 92 to 92F, and now we have this GAR. Okay, so this is a host of uh, the SARS which are there under the Indian tax laws. So before we dwell on the uh, the clause particular, uh, just uh, to take you through the the subtle meaning between tax planning, tax avoidance, and tax evasion. So what is tax planning? It involves planning in order to avail of all exemptions, deductions, rebates provided in the Act. So Income Tax Act itself, uh, you know, encourages planning of taxes. For example, we claim deduction for investment into PPF or CLIC policies or say other, you know, MediClaim, etc. Now, these are the incentives which are given by the government. When we come to tax avoidance, it means reducing tax liability by interpreting treaties and provisions of the Income Tax Act by ignoring the spirit. Now, uh, here the the thin line, it's a very thin line of difference, you know, because what is spirit of the act, sometimes it is very difficult to uh, judge. So, uh, you know, we have a classic, uh, uh, you know, decision of the Supreme Court in case of Vodafone, uh, you know, and then, you know, form versus substance. We have a number of judgments on that, whether the form will prevail or the substance. Now, uh, you know, by and large, in the recent rulings, if we find the the tilt of the even judiciary is towards the substance rather than the form. But in the word of only the form was upheld that uh, yes, form is important. And as long as any transaction is within the four corners of the law, uh, you know, tax, uh, it cannot be regarded as a tax avoidance or tax evasion. That takes us to the third part tax evasion. It is an illegal method uh, to reduce tax liability, like claiming bogus expenses, falsification, non compliance. So this is outrightly. Uh, you know, rejected, there is no doubt. Only there is a thin line of demarcation 
uh, you know, between the tax planning and tax avoidance, and that is where all the litigation revolves around. Now let's dwell with uh, section 96. Arrangement is to be treated as impermissible avoidance arrangement under section 96 of the Act. If there is a tax benefit, there is a tainted element, and which is resulting into GAR. So, what section 96 essentially deals with? Section 96 says that any arrangement which creates rights, obligations, which are not ordinarily created between persons dealing at arm's length, it results directly or indirectly in misuse or abuse of the provisions of the Act. It lacks commercial substance or is deemed to lack commercial substance by virtue of fiction created uh, uh, by section 97 or any arrangement entered into or carried out by means of uh, uh, by means or in a manner which are not ordinarily employed, employed for bona fide purpose. So when we look at this or analyze this particular, you know, four situations which are dealt in 96, this is the crux of the today's discussion. So first and foremost, it creates any right or obligation which are not ordinarily created between persons dealing at arm's length. Now we have a specific SAR, namely transfer pricing, which also deals with a situation which is not at arm's length. A question therefore arises, that if I have reported a transaction in the transfer pricing report, do I again need to report under clause 36? Because it talks about a transaction which is not at arm's length. For example, I have made a say, uh, adjustment in transfer pricing. Sure motor, I have made an adjustment and I offered income of 10 crores, which has a tax implication of more than 3 crores. Now, whether you know, we need to report only three crores or even less. It's a matter of debate. But assuming that I need to report only when the tax benefit is three crores or more. Now, here is a case where I have made an adjustment. I have increased my income and whereby the tax liability is increasing. So, which is not at arm's length. Do I still, is it impermissible avoidance arrangement? Issues or abuse of the uh, at what level we will go up to what level we will go is a question. It lacks commercial substance or is deemed to lack commercial substance by virtue of section 97. Now, uh, section 97, if you look at it again, uh, you know, a very onerous uh, provisions are there, we'll see uh, in a while. So, uh, just like we have a section 91, which is a deemed international transaction, we have here something called deemed transactions which lacks commercial substance. So it is deemed, these transactions are deemed to lack commercial substance. Again, a wide implications. And the last one is the arrangement entered into or is carried out by means of or in a manner which are not ordinarily employed for bona fide business. So bona fide business purpose test has to be, uh, you know, uh, verified in each and every transaction. So these are the, uh, you know, uh, the issues. Now, who has the burden of proof? Now, if you look at the clause, uh, now if you look at the clause 30C, what it says, what I have to report, just look at it. Whether the assessee has entered into an impermissible avoidance arrangement as referred to in section 96 during the previous year, yes or no? So if I say yes, then I have to also report nature of the impermissible avoidance arrangement among in rupees of tax benefit in the previous year, arising in aggregate to all parties of the arrangement. So if there are two parties, three parties, you have to have the tax benefit computed for all of them put together. Now, it is, it is you know, uh, virtually uh, you know, very you know, impossible or it's very difficult to compute the tax benefit arising from a transaction. But the definition is so wide, as I said, you know, the, the four different scenario which we have discussed directly, indirectly, whether it is a non arms length, lacking commercial substance or deemed lacking commercial substance, non bona fide business purpose. It's such a widely worded that it covers almost all kinds of transactions like in, 
it, uh, and again it is not restricted to international transaction the gar is applicable even to a domestic transaction so imagine a situation where there is a transaction between a, a parent company and a subsidiary in india in india and if there is some uh, you know over invoicing under invoicing that could be covered if there is some accommodating party now we have a famous case those who are uh, you know practicing on uh, uh, you know erstwhile vat and gst and, and also uh, you know there were a lot of accommodating parties uh, you know who were issuing bills and uh, these uh, transactions were honored by the vat department and uh, even under income tax uh, you know a huge uh, cases uh, or huge additions are being made Uh, we have uh, the di- especially diamond gems and jewelry industry so where there is a, a one uh, accommodating party which made a confession there was a raid on that party and which made a confession that oh yes i issued bills you know purchase bills and uh, all that uh, those uh, cases could be a potential cases uh, for reporting under 30c and in and friends it's it's very onerous responsibility as a tax auditor because in normal circumstances even even if assessing officer feels that a particular transaction can be brought under gar or impermissible okay. avoidance arrangement first he has to obtain a permission of principal cit or cit then uh, the matter would be referred to a gar approving panel then gar approving panel which is comprising of experts and other you know officials they will first Uh, we will give the opportunities to assess as well as department both okay like uh, you know judiciary and then they will make uh, uh, you know decision whether it is a iia or not now here the tax payer or the audit tax auditor has to opine by himself whether a particular transaction is a impermissible avoidance arrangement or not so in my opinion it's going to be a very tough task when we look at arrangement what does arrangement means so the one good thing is that that most of the crucial uh, you know terms are defined and one difficult thing is that this uh, terms are so widely defined that it can include anything and everything so arrangement means any step any step one step is defined or a part or whole of any transaction operation scheme agreement understanding whether enforceable or not and includes the alienation of any property in such transaction operation scheme agreement or understanding now step what is step step includes a measure or action even one action okay can be uh, regarded as a step particularly one of a series taken in order to deal with or achieve a particular thing or subject in the arrangement definition of connected persons will not go into the detail but uh, one can read under section 102 it's basically any relative for the person if an individual director of the company relative so you can think of any situation which they have brought in under the definition of connected persons okay tax benefit this is very crucial so how do you measure a tax benefit so a reduction or avoidance of deferral of tax or any other amount payable under this so you want the deferment of the tax is considered as a tax benefit increase in refund or another amount under this act reduction of avoidance of deferral of another ta- of uh, of tax or another amount that would be payable under this act or even as a result of a tax treaty so you want a tax treaty benefit which results into deferral okay or reduction or avoidance of tax that can be cons- computed as a tax benefit so if i uh, enter enter into a certain arrangement whereby my tax liability is, is reduced for example uh, say i want to invest in usa okay i can go directly but i decide to go via uae because to take advantage of india uae tax treaty tomorrow officer can say that this particular arrangement is resulting in a tax benefit okay and your main purpose is to obtain a tax benefit now in the arrangement the the wordings are such that even if a part of one step also where the main purpose is tax benefit so even in the entire arrangement when i look at the entire arrangement it doesn't result into tax benefit but even a significant or one step results into main purpose is tax benefit the entire arrangement can be questioned 
So that is the far reaching implications of this GAR provisions or this IIA provision. An increase in refund of tax or another amount under this act as a result of a tax treaty, a reduction in total income or increase in loss. All these kind of situations will be covered under the tax benefit. Now, here one question comes. Suppose when I have to re uh, report this. So it is whose responsibility or the onus is on whom to prove that a transaction is a guard or impermissible avoidance arrangement. Now, section 96.2 says that main purpose of a step or a part of the arrangement is to obtain a tax benefit. <coughs> then, unless proven to the contrary by the assessor, unless proven to the contrary by the assessor, it is presumed, it is presumed that the main, the object is to tax, uh, save the tax. So, according to me, the owner's first is on the assessee and guidance code also confirms that at paragraph number 56.3. But, unfortunately, after discussing the the hierarchy of uh, the invocation of guard provisions under the act, which I said, you know, AOCIT, PCIT, and the approving panel. At para 56.5, the guidance note says the totally opposite. What guidance note says that considering this hierarchy of invoking guard and its declaration, the primary onus to establish that an arrangement is in uh, permissible avoidance arrangement is on the revenue. Now, if the primary onus is on revenue, then why, how, how and why should I report? Why should I report as IA in first place in 30C? Because it is not on my uh, you know, uh, responsibility. But the section is very clear, 96 uh, subsection 2. And therefore, primary onus is on the assessee. And that is where the, the, the whole trouble is. So, where the tax benefit does not exist now, uh, non applicability of these guard provisions. So, where the tax ben uh, ben uh, rule to 10 you says that where the tax benefit does not exceed 3 crores rupees. Okay. Yeah, in aggregate for all parties, excluding interest and penalty. And two excep exceptions are given one is for the FIIs and one is for the non residents who are investing through FIIs. So, in, in this case, uh, GAR is not applicable, plus any income arising prior to 1st April 2017. Now, it talks about any income arising. It does not talk about any investment made prior to. So, any arrangement or any in, in investment prior to 1st April 2017, but today resulting in income would be covered under the GAR provisions. So, grandfathering is only to all the income which has arisen prior to 1st April 2017 and not otherwise. Uh, Ashok Bhai, it's uh, 6.31. Can I take five more minutes? Oh, sure. So I'll just... Uh... Okay. So, arrangement to lay commercial substance, the substance or effect of the arrangement as a whole is inconsistent with or differs significantly from the form of its individual steps or a part. So, uh, you know, we have to look at the arrangement as a whole, look at each step and then, uh, you know, apply the provisions. So section 97 deals with the deeming, you know, I said, you know, what, what are the transactions which are deemed to lack commercial substance? So one is a round tripping. Okay. So what does round tripping means? The transactions are conducted through one or more persons and disguised value location source ownership <coughs> control of funds. So it involves an accommodating party. It involves round tripping and it involves elements that have the effect of offset or cancelling each other. Now, these are the types of transactions which are considered to be lacking commercial substance. The first is that substance or the effect of arrangement as a whole which is inconsistent. Second is round tripping. Third is any location of asset, transaction or place of residence of any party which is without any substantial commercial purpose other than obtaining a tax benefit for a party. And D. So there are, these are the four situations in 97. It does not have a significant effect upon the business risk or net cash flows of any party to the arrangement apart from any effect attributable to the tax benefit that could be obtained, but for the provisions of this chapter. So, uh, you know, 
the transaction which is not having any uh, you know uh, significant effect on the business deal etc now these are all very subjective in nature and it is very difficult for a tax auditor to you know get into this and determine so now let's coming to the reporting and what uh, we should do so return representation from the assc we should take certificate from the assc that uh, what transfer pricing adjustments have been made in the returns of the income filed during the previous year even the earlier years even for the uh, iia of course it's a new transaction so there would not be any previous history but uh, going forward each year tax auditors representations should include that we uh, have or we did not have any impermissible avoidance arrangement okay or declared so far whether any advance pricing agreement was entered into during the previous year whether any transaction transfer pricing adjustment was made confirmed in assessment order appealed during the uh, order passed by during the previous year whether any agreement has been arrived under a mutual ag agreement procedure during the previous year these are the mandatory things which we should take in now coming to the few issues before i uh, you know conclude whether the reporting under transfer pricing and tax audit clause 30c are mutually exclusive we have already discussed this issue because both deals with the non arms length principle or uh, transactions at non arms length and we need to uh, you know report now this is very very crucial suppose as a auditor i took a position and i write that the so and so arrangement according to me is a impermissible avoidance arrangement naturally assess is not going to accept it see tax audit report uh, is to be signed by our accountant okay means started accountant it is not to be signed by the uh, party though we uh, as a normal practice we do we take a counter signature but the assess can challenge that okay and naturally they, they would be challenging now if it is challenged by assess and ultimately gar approving panel says that no no assess is right there is no impermissible avoidance arrangement now the auditor would be in trouble because the assess would say that you put me in loss you put me in all inconvenience because of your wrong reporting i have to suffer this now imagine as reverse situation where as a tax auditor i take a stand that there is no impermissible avoidance arrangement but department honors some transaction okay and ultimately gar panel approves it and it turns out to be any impermissible avoidance arrangement then again the government would be after the tax auditor that you gave a wrong reporting and you are subjected to penalty so <coughs> you are in it big trouble either way either we report or even we don't report so can we sit in a judgment and and regard any transaction or any arrangement rather transaction is a you know very restricted word arrangement is a very wide word and so any any uh, any restructuring any structuring in fact i would say even normal export and import transactions also can come under the scanner especially when it is with the related party under invoicing or invoicing accommodating party accommodation entry so it means we have to be extremely careful even in the domestic transactions so gar shall be applicable if tax benefit exceeds rupees 3 crores or more however if tax benefits are less than the prescribed limit now see if we look at the reporting it doesn't make it doesn't talk about the limit if you see what it says whether the associate impermissible avoidance arrangement now when we go to section 96 it does not talk about three crores of rupees it only talks about reference to 97 now the 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 three cross limit is given by the rule okay and it talks about when where the tax benefit does not exceed three crores in aggregate that is for the gar provisions and in my opinion impermissible avoidance arrangement is is wider than the gar in a way unless we equate both the same so suppose if the tax benefit comes out only to two crores so does it mean that it will not be regarded as impermissible avoid arrangement at all or i still need to report <coughs> but gar may not be applicable the big question guidance note is silent on this guidance note only says that you look at the previous you know history 
whether there was any impermissible avoidance arrangement you report on that if there is implications of the current year transaction current year tax benefit you report on this because these are all the issues which would come up as we go along and uh, finally finally friends i personally believe it's an extremely extremely risky proposition for a tax auditor to sign uh, this kind of uh, you know clause uh, i think it's a time to take a professional indemnity as well and uh, the best part is that institute has realized to some some extent and they have given this disclaimer which uh, would be widely used according to me that in the absence of access to the books of account and other records of various parties to arrangement and want of elaborate investigations beyond the ordinary process of audit involved in determining whether the arrangement is an impermissible arrangement and in determining the tax benefit in the assessment year relevant to the previous year under audit arising in aggregate to all the parties to the arrangement we are unable to determine the view of the assessee regarding its his entrance into any impermissible avoidance agreement as contemplated under section 96 of the act during the previous now here only one uh, correction is that it's not impermissible avoidance agreement but arrangement it should be arrangement so there is some mistake in the guidance note which uh, uh, you know we will need to point it out to the ici but again see the disclaimer is rightly worded because uh, if i have to report any iia then i have to be an investigating agency I, i as a auditor it is very clear my job is to report whether the the compilation or the the records which are produced before me are true and correct i am not saying that you know something which i have worked i am not supposed to do an investigation then otherwise my role will be a different kind of auditor as a tax auditor uh, i should not get into the shoes of a uh, you know forensic auditing and uh, you know reporting again tax audit is a, a big big problem because see statutory auditor uh, if i am a statutory auditor i am appointed by shareholders i report to shareholders if i am an internal auditor i am appointed by management i report to the management tax audit is one thing where i am appointed by a management management but report to the government and what report report all that wrong things which management has done i am supposed to report to the government so there is a conflict of interest there is a lot of dif- uh, difficulties i think uh, one one should, should be very careful before putting a signature on this particular item thank you very much it's less than three crores you said yeah even if it is less than your uh, there is an issue what is your personal view i personally today in absence of information i would report it. but first of all i would not report it only because see who am i to dis- determine yeah, that's right so i am not going to report i am going to give disclaimer only because see uh, three cross first of all i have to have access of the older party's record yeah now uh, uh, if if it is related party i can still have it but if it is unrelated party definitely i am not going to have it again in the related party also it's very difficult even if the accounting party is there for example i want have a, rec- a record of his books of accounts okay. so i i don't see i don't think anybody would report except where in the previous year for example my client any transaction is already reported or declared as iia then i am in a trouble and that's what i just said so then i then even I, even if it is one crore i would report It's practical also. It needs to be prepared by assessing. <coughs> Correct, but but so so that is statute. Yeah, exactly. So in the statute, yeah, absolutely, you are right. In statute audit, what the language we use, it is a role and responsibility of the management. Auditor's yeah. job is only to express opinion. But here we are not going to and fair view. We are giving to and correct, and that's yeah. what even section this clause forty four will have a trouble. How are we going to certify? Each and every figure. Good question, sir. Any Box question, friends? Uh, sir. Uh, yes. Any, any, uh, you know, specific situation you see where the reporting uh, may trigger because otherwise it is for a department to, uh, and uh, you know, identify the import, uh, impermissible transaction. Exactly, so, that's what I'm saying. But the section 96 too says 
that unless but, it is proved by the SSC. Yeah. So even dividend versus buyback, because dividend attracts full tax. Buyback, you know, attracts twenty percent, you know, Correct. tax. So can the government realize that this is a uh, avoidance of tax to the promoter group? You know how far it so, one can. So dividend and buyback could be little on a weaker ground for for the department to argue. The reason is that it is part of the uh, you know uh, statute, but dividend stripping, yes. Yeah, but dividend because it buyback could be generally in case of buyback. Uh, I have seen you know there are more uh, non-tax considerations than the tax considerations. Okay, so as long as we are able to prove that uh, the main purpose is not a tax avoidance, okay, or tax benefit rather, not even they are not using tax for they are using tax benefit. So as long as my main purpose is not tax benefit and I can uh, substantiate it, I think there should not be issue. Oh. Question, but right? but you are ah. right. You know, department can argue and in, invoke in any any situation. Then we have to fight it out. Mayur Bhai, see regarding secondary yes. adjustment made in certain cases, 92 CE, the primary adjustment. So with a, we are auditing for current year. So how we can give prime secondary? What will the effect of transaction? Whether he will bring back money that substantial water benefit has been taken by other party. So you are talking about 30A or 30C? Ah, uh, 30A, 32A. Yeah, 32A small a. Correct. So it is very difficult. I agree with you. In fact, you know, uh, let me tell you, give, you know, generally in 195 before my 195 lecture, I give a statutory warning. No, that after listening to me, you may not be able, comfortable signing. You know, 15 CS, 15 CB. Because uh, you know we sign a lot of forms in ignorance. So likewise, tax audit also, this 30A, 30B, 30C, there are a lot of risk involved uh, as far as the auditor is concerned. See, assessor in any case is going to contest and fight it out. No, nowadays they lay a penalty on the auditors. But I agree, there is a there is a there is a problem. I audit for 22, 23. So now whatever may be effect that no subsequent year that. So you can, yeah, you can you can write no no comments no you means it is impossible to perform. Impossible. Yeah, unable to, oh, yes yes. Correct correct I agree with you. Ashok Sharma has stated in his opening remark that a blend of uh, knowledge on direct tax and indirect tax. Uh, let me clarify that uh, in the initial years of my uh, practice I was practicing more on the front of direct tax. Uh, Perhaps post a service tax, maybe say 97 onwards or so, I was more tilted toward the indirect tax and now substantial time goes on indirect tax. As regarding the direct tax, I have a little working knowledge. Perhaps, but I think for clause number 44 is concerned, uh, you will be looking forward for more of the indirect tax uh, perhaps uh, uh, perspective. Although it is a forming part and parcel of the tax audit report, which is normally signed by a, a accountant who is more dominantly practicing in the taxation front or direct tax front. Friends, uh, uh, let me tell you honestly, the we are living in the world of specialization today. But when you go and sign the reports, tax audit report, be it a company audit report or tax audit report, I personally feel you need to have a knowledge of a lot of areas or a lot of laws, you know, and when it comes to a specifically today's topic, a tax auditor has to have such an in-depth knowledge uh, for indirect tax, something which is very difficult to digest, uh, the kind of details which have been sought for, it's going to be an onerous task uh, for the auditor, he has to take a call, how far he will able to justify uh, well, friends, uh, the we are uh, the clause number forty-four. The little background of this part is concerned. Uh, as uh, Mr. Mayur Nag, my pre previous speaker, has stated that about GAR provision clause thirty is also kept on deferring by the government, and it was kept on uh, postponement. Same thing has issued uh, happened with clause number forty-four of form number three CD. Uh, it was in the year two thousand and eighteen. Uh, the first time the form was modified by notification in the month of July 18, but thereafter immediately we got a, a circular whereby the order under section 119 was issued and it was deferred till 2019, later on 2020, thereafter 21 and ultimately 2022. So it was extended for four times. I'll not read the verbatim, this PPT I already circulated or handed, rather handed over to CTC, perhaps you will get it from them. 
uh, so the final version is concerned it was it was kept in abeyance till 31st of march 2022 and that is the latest circular we have of 15th of march 2029 and thereby order 119 was been passed so uh, friends uh, let me tell you that means perhaps uh, uh, even the professionals as well as the assc was aware about this clause but uh, for almost four years when government was uh, for one or other reason was not implementing perhaps uh, even the business community as well as the professional were not serious on this and there are not much of the you know rather debate or planning done by many of the business entity or even the auditors have never thought wow. of this front perhaps we are thinking this time also we will get an extension on this front because form number 3b is undergoing change in gst which is a return monthly return which we are filing anyway now uh, the time has come and the tax audit due date is there in september we need to file so we are in the last three weeks time left out for this year uh, and how we should go about the institute has also come out with a guidance note which is a revised guidance note on tax audit and which was released only on this 20 august 2022 whereby a commentary is given on this clause number 44 Uh, it is around five pages. They have given in para number eighty-two of the guidance note, uh, starting from page number two fifty-five and up to two fifty-nine. So very important few of the clarification we got it. So in my presentation, what I have done is concern we have uh, first of all what is the requirement, uh, what is envisaged by the form. I'll explain that in brief with, with the columns. Uh, uh, then I, I have taken out few issues. Uh, I am also thankful. Uh, let me acknowledge that uh, Mr. Ashok has also given me a couple of issues which I have already incorporated. There are about dozen issues which I have taken, but uh, perhaps there will be endless issues which perhaps if you are having, uh, either Ashok by or any of the participant can ask. Uh, be the time permitted, I will try to understand. But uh, let me clarify, both of us, myself and you, all of you are on a learning phase or learning stage rather on this topic is concerned. now the first is when it, applicability of this clause very important uh, whether it will be applicable 31st march 2020 till that it was kept in abeyance how to interpret that is very very important because that means this clause has been operative from 1st of april 2022 is it that the period starting after 1st of april 2022 or it is the order which is sorry the report which is signed or uploaded after 1st of april 22 how that applicability date has to be worked out is going to be a moot question so the let us for that let us go to the circular which is a text of the circular i have reproduced here uh, dated 25th of march uh, the this is reproduction of the wording what it says in view of the prevailing situation due to covid 19 the pandemic across the country it has been decided by the board that the reporting under clause 30c and clause 44 of the act Uh, of the tax audit report shall be kept in abeyance till 31st march that means reporting of this clause is kept in abeyance okay till that time the language is concerned there is a confusion and which you are decide it is applicable for period up to march 22 or a report sign up to march 22 that is what is a point of uh, which need to be understood and clarified so we should go to the language of the original order of 2018 when this particular clause was uh, rather notified or rolled out and in that that point of time the wordings were concerned the the specifically that particular notification says that the matter has been examined and it has been decided by the board that reporting under the proposed clause 30c and 44 of the report is shall be kept in abeyance till march 31st 2019 that was for the first time and therefore the for tax audit report to be furnished on or after 20 august 2018 now you mark the word what they have written is tax audit report to be furnished on or after 20th august 2018 but before april 1st 2019 the tax auditor will not be required to furnish the detail if you go by the language which is used in the original circular of 2018 and that time when it was kept in abeyance the the entire uh, the wordings were harping on it was a date of furnishing of the report it was never talking about it was pertaining to which financial year or which period it may be so what was extended or other kept in abeyance is only if you have signed the report till per that particular day if you go by that spirit and if you take it a harmonious view that means my personal view is any tax audit report for whatever year pertaining to any of the year 
whether it is belated or so, if it is signed up to 31st of March 2022, you need not incorporate this clause number 44. But if you sign post 1st of April 2022, irrespective of the year for which it pertains, in my view, clause number 44 need to be incorporated and you need to give the details thereof on that. So these are on the first issue part is concerned. Uh, Ashok Bhai, if you have any contrary view, comments, etc., you can please give it. Uh, let me tell you honestly, all of us are learning on this topic. So that is what yeah. is on. And with this, I have given an example here. There will be a date of signing. There is a date of generating of UDN. And there may be furnishing of the return on the portal. And normally, these are the three aspects which takes place in the, any of the tax audit report. Because it's our duty to sign on the portal, that part. So there are different, different situations I have worked out in first situation. The report was physically signed on March 22. UDN was also generated before March 22. But on portal, it was uploaded on 5th April 22. Uh, whichever year you want to take, you can take maybe 18, 19, 19, 20, 21, 20, uh, 20, 21, any of the year. Whether 44 has to be applicable, in my view, it is no. For the reason that you are already signed the report. And signing of the report is most important. 20, even UDIN generating will not be important because many a time institute has given extended the time limit for generating UDIN. Sometimes they give one month's time, 15 days time or maybe extended time. Uh, in my view, what is important is your date of signing. That is a date you have issued the tax audit report. I personally go by that. Thereby, if you look at the second example, the signing happened on 28th March, but UDIN and the furnishing on the portal has happened post 1st of April. So in my view, <coughs> also the 44 clause will not be applicable because report is already signed on 28th of March. Only in the third case, when the report signature has happened on 2nd of April, it is since it is after 1st of April, clause number 44 will be applicable. I'm sure by and large, all of us are right now in the for financial year 21-22 and all of us are signing post 1st of April. So this issue may not be, but this will be for those who are signing the old tax audit report, which are belated one. For them, this may be of little relevance to their extent. Now, why you want such clause number 44 in the tax audit report? In my view, I have few of the uh, few of the uh, <coughs> points which clicks to my mind that why government want all those. The, if you look at the GST returns, etc., uh, original scheme of filing of GST or one, two, three has been scrapped and it has been done away with. And we have right from day one, which may be uh, portal issues or as the case, maybe government has come down or narrowed down the scope to only a summarized 3B return and GSTR1 return. But then simultaneously, there are a lot of artificial intelligence is working and data collection is happening. And we have seen quite a few notices have been issued uh, for evading, uh, for identifying the tax leakages and identifying the tax evader. We have seen in the service tax regime, they have uh, matched the figures of the income tax portal turnover with the service tax returns. And quite a few notices have been issued and they have generated quite a few amount of revenue also. Similarly, <coughs> we have seen that government a couple of years back has introduced the form number 26 AS. Uh, whereby all over TDS uh, related matters have been reported and TDS details amounts are reported. Now, that based on that also, many of the people uh, have been other assessees have been identified by the government and the tax leakages were been identified. So these are the different, different uh, modus operandi or methods or initiatives taken by the government to in, uh, reduce the tax evasion or either you can say uh, pre uh, prevent the tax leakages. This data mining is uh, nowadays going one step ahead when customs data, GST data, income tax data, they are all getting mapped over a period. You will find the stamp duty transactions and it will cover more and more within its net over a period. Perhaps in this clause number 44, if you look at that, basically you need to give the detail of the expenditure with the different, different breakup. Uh, in that major breakup is registered dealer and unregistered dealer with the most important. Even if, let me tell you honestly, even if your details have gone a little bit here and there, in the sense if it is not a correct, then also there may, may not be any a tax implication coming on you because it is not changing your income tax liability as well as it is not changing your GST liability. But what will happen is this, in based on this information, the department may seek other information from you and they will issue the notices. Like if you declare my purchases or expenses, from unregistered dealer is XYZ amount. Over a period, they may ask you give a breakup and they will start issuing the notices to this person. Okay, why you are not paid GST, etc., etc. So we have to be very careful. Although the impact of this clause number 42, uh, the person assessing whose accounts are audited, 
it may not have direct impact on his tax liability or his gst tax liability but it will have effect on the cross checks and based on that the department is working and over a period you will find the consequential penal consequences also may be there the major thing if you have seen in gst there is one very important amendment took place in 2019 first of april and that was specifically for the builders now in the case of builder it is only for the builders under the gst there is a requirement that builders should procure minimum 80% of their goods from the registered dealer if that falls below the 80% of their inward supply then to the extent it falls below 80% builder is required to pay tax under reverse charge as on the purchase and reverse charge at the rate of 18% i have just, those who are not practicing gst in detail let me give examples for the entire year say financial year a builder developer's total expenditure is say 1 lakh rupees and in the 1 lakh rupees there will be various items of expenses it may not it will include some purchases services admin expense etc if say 75 rupees 75000 out of this 1 lakh is only from the gst registered dealer then that builder has violated the condition and there because the condition is minimum 80% should be from registered dealer so to the extent of that 5000 rupees shortfall builder will have to pay tax under reverse charge at the rate of 18% and that is how the, the builders are concerned have become a cautious and rather they will have to ensure that they deal with the supplier who are registered if not it will cost them 80% let me tell you that even if your purchases are concerned that may carry 5% rate 12% rate but you need to pay at the rate of 18% only on all the shortfall except cement that the rate may be 28% now i am sure in this clause number 44 i am anticipating such kind of provision may come down the line maybe two years down the line you will have such kind of provision that if you purchase but the, the uh, sub uh, expenses if you incur and that expenses they will put some percentage say 10% if more than 10% of your expenses are from unregistered gst dealer then perhaps they may not allow a deduction. Possibly, this kind of provision may come in income tax so that what happens, more and more numbers of people are covered under the GST net and more and more revenue is also generated and it will be more and more transparency that is perhaps seems to be. Otherwise, this clause number 44 over a period may not serve much of the purpose, either a cross-check or find out this thing. So I have given, these are the few of the things which I am anticipating and 44 right now in a very primary stage. Like GAR is concerned, as Mayur Bhai stated, the idea was rolled out in 2012 and real implications comes after maybe about 8-10 years. Same thing will happen as regarding this 44 is concerned. Let us start with the topic per se thereafter now. Now what is the clause number 44 is anticipating? Currently clause number 44, it is barely worded. <coughs> it says that you need to give a breakup of total expenditure of entity, reg entities, registered or not, under GST. This is what the heading. And then there is a table which has got seven columns. Mind you, I have missed the first column because of the pay, but that is a serial number. Otherwise, this is column number two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are the columns in this table you have to report. Now, let us go one by one column. The first column talks about total amount of expenditure incurred during the year. So the word is expenditure incurred. Fine. Uh, even in the heading, it is written total expenditure by uh, incurred. Now thereafter, there is a second clause which talks about expenditure in respect of entities registered under GST. Now within the GST, if you are registered, then that particular transaction again you have to split in four clauses cl columns three four five and six uh, so the if your purchase or your expenses are from registered dealer then further classification is clause number three that is relating to goods or service which are exempt from gst mind well mind the word because in my view the table the terms being used are concerned very loosely being used and it is still giving, if you technically interpret, it will give a different meaning. For the reason that goods and service tax is concerned, it is taxed only when there is a transaction of supply of goods or services. If it is if it not supply of goods or service, GST will not be applicable. Now, if you look at the column here, in column number two, they never talk about goods and service. They say total expenditure. When it comes to column number three, they talk about relating to goods and service, which are exempt. Again, if you look at column number four, relating to 
uh, uh, entities falling under composition scheme. Composition scheme is under GST, so that is obviously a registered dealer who is opting for composition. The fifth column is relating to other registered entity. Now, all these things is other registered entities means other than falling under three and four and the total payment to register entity. Now, actually word payment, if you interpret literally, that means if something you are not paid for, perhaps it may not come. That kind of interpretation can also come. They could have written total expenses uh, of incurred uh, for, from the register dealer, but they have used the word payment, which is not there in clause number three, four and five. So let me tell you, it is a bit loosely drafted. I'm sure there may be some interpretation issue, but as regarding we are concerned, in my view, we will try to give a harmonious interpretation rather than entering into unwanted litigation, because right now these are all disclosure. I have told you in beginning only, it will not affect your GST liability, neither it will affect your income tax liability as on today. Over a period of time, based on the amendment of the provision, there may be a changes, but these are the difference. So something which I have written in red color in my presentation are the keywords that you can see. And the last is the seventh column, expenditure relating to entity not registered. Now, if you see that everywhere, somewhere they have used the word expenditure, somewhere they have used the word payment, somewhere they have used the scheme, but without writing the goods and services, and somewhere they write uh, relating to goods and service. With all these things, the, the wordings, I'm not very happy, but we'll try to give a balanced interpretation on this. So this is some and substance of the clause is concerned. Now we'll go by issues one by one on that part. The first is, yeah, sure, boy. Yeah, sure. Uh, in the previous slide, yeah. uh, there was a, a misunderstanding by, by some members that yeah. open payment includes all the payments in the uh, uh, bank account or something like that. So Correct. I think it also has uh, referred to as expenditure over year. And Correct. In the guidance note has clarified this. So yeah. uh, it, Total payment should not be used to. Uh, are you of the view that total payment should not be used very widely? Do you agree with that or would they say? Yeah, I will say that this is we are talking about clause number six, column number six, and where the yeah. words are total payment to register entity. My view is concerned, although the words is payment, I will say that total expenditure incurred during a financial year uh, uh, for which you have purchased uh, your invoice from registered entities. That's what will come over here. That is what. So I will not uh, give meaning to payment that way. I'll go by the amount of expenditure incurred. You might not have paid. It is on a credit. But once you got an invoice, that has to be included. In some ways, going one step ahead, anything which is debited to PNL account or if it is addition to a fixed asset or any capital expenditure, so these two things need to be added or included. And I think that will get clarified when I'll deal with the other issues. But I hope that payment and not to be understood that you make payment to creator. It may be possible some creators are standing for last four years and you are making payment of them to this year. In my view, that amount you should not include because that is not related to expenditure incurred during the year. This tax audit report is for particular year. In our today discussion, we'll presume that it is only for 21-22. So 21-22, the officer is more interested in. That is what is my view. Now, as Ashok said, Institute in the guidance note has also clarified that. Yeah, so correct. It, in effect, that, that is six is the total of three, four, and five. Yes. Uh, no, no. I will. Uh, yeah, yeah. Three, four, and five. You are trying to go by that. Yes, fine. Absolutely. Total payment. It will. Yes, to that extent, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Right. So with yeah. this uh, issue number uh, one, uh, whether information is to be given for each head of expenditure or consolidated figure of total expenditure. Uh, I, I'm sure I will not able to uh, give, go back to the table, but the table in the first clause, it says that total expenditure. And the question here is that whether because you will have various expenditure, different different head in your PL account, whether you need to give breakup of per head or qua total expenditure. Now, for that, the wording in the table has used the total expenditure. When they specifically say total expenditure, the form itself is not envisaging headwise breakup. That is what is my view is concerned, and it is supported by our guidance note of institute. I have given relevant para number also 82.1, which clarifies that you need not give breakup like stationary conveyance or staff welfare or rent, etc., salary, etc. So headwise breakup is not envisaged, but you should give only consolidated figure to be incorporated in this clause. 
if you want to uh, as a precaution we followed a practice that we have given consolidated figure right as a disclosure if you want to make it that way but otherwise it is presumed when the word is used total expenditure that is my view on the first issue next is total expenditure whether includes revenue as well as capital expenditure because the the in income tax we have a concept of revenue expenditure as well as capital expenditure and normally the capital expenditure will be by and large will be kind of thing which is a uh, it is either uh, addition to fixed asset or a deferred revenue expenditure kind of thing or something which you write off over a period of time say lease premiums etc those kind of expenditure may be there now whether expenditure so the, if you again go back to the words a uh, language in my view expenditure total expenditure include both it is revenue as well as capital expenditure you need to include the both that means the amount of debit side of trading profit and loss account will not be a full stop you need to add to that the all additions made to fixed asset because that will be capital expenditure plus any deferred revenue expenditure if you are there and treated that at asset which you write off over a period of time and if you have incurred during there that also you need to add it up and that consolidated amount will come only thing is that this is also clarified by uh, i issued in para 82.15 of the guidance note and here issued was stays one step ahead they say that you can give a break up within that well, you write down revenue expenditure one line and second is a capital expenditure that will give very easy in understanding and reconciling the data the, so uh, uh, the best way is to give separate figures for revenue and separate figure for the capital expenditure but you need to give both details the third is concern whether details of depreciation or loss on sale of assets etc such kind of transactions also need to be included now the question comes is concern i have stated in some and substance the debit side of trading and profit and loss account is the one so we have many such items which are given which are deductible like depreciation loss on sale of asset etc sometimes write offs etc fine so whether that will has to be included so if you now again go back to the clause and take column number 2 it uses the word total expenditure by all mean depreciation or loss on sale of asset is concerned they are definitely an expenditure but the part is concerned under income tax section 32 depreciation is an allowance the percentage they allow you a percentage only this much will be allowed see in the books of account you may claim more or less that's your choice if it is non corporate entity under corporate you have a depreciation under the companies act which may be a different as against what is there in income tax but basically under income tax it is an allowance and as against uh, companies act is concerned it is a charge or rather it is the expenses which you have incurred by writing off the depreciation of the asset portion now institute in its para 82.2 stated that depreciation need not be included in column number 3 to 7 because 3 to 7 column is concerned it is for the expenditure incurred by you it is more of a inward supply either you have purchased from register dealer or purchase from unregistered dealer these are the only two, two choice and within that there may be possibility of exempted goods or there may be a composition dealer so by and large 3 to 7 you are not to include but column number 2 is concerned it is advisable to include the same so column number 2 may please include depreciation as well as sale of uh, loss on sale of asset by any chance you don't want to include because uh, as against that unfortunate part of this is concerned cbic although has notified this but there is no circular giving clarification of various issues which is coming out of it till the circular is not there my humble suggestion and view is concern whatever method you want to follow please make a disclosure so i will try to take a depreciation on the column number 2 and it will not be included by me in 3 to 7 and um, uh, suitably i'll write a note also but those who don't want to include in column 2 also then they can put a note below that that depreciation and such kind of these are not included the only question may come that when you are filing a tax audit report on the portal such kind of notes are allowed to be incorporated or not that i am not very much sure about it but you can definitely give in the signed report that can be so either method will good prudently i will try to include that in column number 2 by way of a note rajiv can i add something yes sir yeah so in this thing you can add the note in your uh, form 3cb clause 5 yes uh, the- You put over there at form 3C A clause 3. Correct. Uh, you can add the notes over there. Correct. Uh, also, a difficulty uh, which my office was telling me that when you try to fill up the utilities, huh. 
your clause two is not equal to clause six or seven. Yes. Clause six, it is showing an error in okay. the utility. I don't okay. know whether. Uh, 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 so how do you? Uh, so there is this problem. अच्छा ओके ओके सो यू मीन टू से व्हेन यू आर अपलोडिंग ऑन अ पोर्टल सिक्स प्लस सेवन शुड कम इज इक्वल टू टू करेक्ट दैट इज द लॉजिक व्हिच हैज बीन पुट बाय द यूटिलिटी सो आई वुड ओके ओके टोटल एक्सपेंसेस कंसाइड विथ माय प्रॉफिट एंड लॉस बट ओके दे वी ट्राई टू पुट इट एंड द यूटिलिटी वाज गिविंग गिविंग अ एरर मैसेज ओके पॉसिबल दैट दे माइट रेक्टिफाई दैट बिकॉज़ टोटल एक्सपेंडिचर वुड मीन द एंटायर एक्सपेंडिचर fine i i appreciate ashok because i have not uploaded my office has so far not told me this kind of thing but anyway if that being a case okay then it is you cannot include depreciation in column number 2 or even the loss on sale of asset then you have to disclose that these are the expenditure which are not included in column number 2 to that extent then it will automatically tally otherwise no see the, we are living in the world no the law is concerned the cart is uh, ahead of bullock because portal is uh, important in gst we have seen how important the portal is although it is bullshit and uh, many a time same thing perhaps is happening in gst but somehow if portal doesn't allow then we have to find out me, uh, media and uh, you know via media and plus we also need to ensure that that physical tax audit report may we make a proper disclosure at the end of the day yeah. it's written in clause 82.14 पोर्टल but otherwise in principle i don't agree to that means uh, yeah. uh, to the because because the portal is not allowing uh, otherwise i will go by this thing it is a total amount of expenditure is concerned depreciation is also an expenditure i can understand it is allowance under income tax when you compute your income but otherwise it is also an expenditure a business expenditure yes yeah, so we, what we are doing in my office is we are reconciling it in the notes uh, where we say that this much expenditure is not taken the total yes. with the Loss is reconciled to this extent because we can't put it over there. Absolutely, I appreciate that because I said you that we need to give import at the end of the day we should able to successfully file and upload the return on the portal. So we need to ensure that. Of course, over a period of time, CPDT may change it. That's a different issue. The next issue is uh, uh, whether details of provision of expenses such as auditor's remuneration. <laughs> or product warranty provisions various provision we make it even reserve for doubtful day bad debts etc those kind of provisions if we are making whether we need to include in the uh, column uh, this uh, table now first of all provision is to as regard the corporates are concerned to meet the uh, accrual system of accounting requirement which is mandatory for them and the provisions are normally uh, estimate of the expenditure likely expenditure Uh, now, actual expenditure may differ from the provision. So, uh, the the point is concerned, and you get deductions for the provision under income tax. Uh, the there may be plus and minus which get adjusted over a period of time. So, if you strictly go by the interpretation, uh, again, uh, it is not the expenses which you have incurred, but the same which is applicable for the earlier clause which we have discussed about the depreciation and other. the same analogy in my view should be uh, applied to this part also and you if you don't want to include provision uh, because 2 and 6 7 need to be match uh, i think uh, we should go about with this yeah i'm sorry yeah huh? uh, this is not obstructing no 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 fine fine rajiv bhai there is one question in the uh, chat box yes uh, Can you uh, read it out so that I can? Yeah. Clause forty four is applicable uh, where the SSC is not registered under GST law. Uh, uh, clause forty four is applicable when yes yes. See, uh, it is talking about registration of a details sought for or called for in clause number forty four about the uh, details of vendor from whom you are purchasing. or to whom you are making a payment towards expenses etc so you are not see like you are a doctor 
and you are truly giving only medical services and you don't have any taxable service because of the exemption gst number you may not be having and you are not registered fine no, but you are you are liable for tax audit because of turnover and you might have incurred various expenses so in my view yes it will be applicable because section for the once tax audit report is a tax audit is applicable you need to give the entire 3c a or 3c b along with 3c d as the case may be and 3c d is a table of information clause number 40 where you can't say not applicable because the heading is breakup of total expenditure if doctor is having this expenditure he need to give the detail of this so the registration of the assessee under gst is not at all a uh, cause of concern or requirement to find out whether 44 is applicable in my view it will be applicable to each and every ssc and i'll go to the next now yes. the next issue is concern transaction of expenditure covered in schedule 3 of section 7 or section 7 2b of the cgst act whether required to be reported now, uh, many of the participants here may not have a uh, detailed exposure on the GST. So, let me explain about it. Uh, see, the goods and service tax is concerned. It is a tax only on supply of goods or service. If you don't do either of these two, there will not be applicability of GST. And the terms goods and service have been defined. The more important definition of goods are concerned, fine. It's nothing very great about it. It includes all the tangible like we have in sale of goods of act. But when it comes to the services, anything other than goods is defined as a service. And that is what is a big challenge. So that means any, anything and everything which is not goods will fall within the services. Now, GST is concerned. GST covers each and every goods and service. But there are certain transactions, uh, certain uh, items which are kept outside the purview of GST. As on today, predominantly it is a petroleum products, that is petrol, diesel, oil. And secondly, a uh, liquor for human consumption. These are the predominant items which are kept outside the purview of GST, although they are goods. So GST, they are not covered in. But then there are certain transactions which the GST law itself has defined or identified or carved out as neither goods nor service for the purpose of GST. And those are listed in schedule number three to section seven. So for the purpose of GST, they will not be treated as goods or neither goods nor services. Similarly, there is a section 7 subclause 2 subclause B, whereby government is empowered to deter, define or rather announce any goods or transaction as neither goods nor services. <laughs> you can find many transactions will be neither good nor services for GST. So that's why now what are those transactions? So it is very, very important for you to know. Otherwise, you will not able to fill up this column of the 44 clause. Now, first is say salary contribution, PF, ESIC, gratuity. These are the contribution if you are making. This is neither uh, goods nor services. Secondly, uh, tri tribunal fee, court fees, court fee stamps, etc. You are paying. That will not be there. Purchase of land and a building. If your land you are purchasing, it will be falling in Schedule 3. A building, building means not under construction. If you have, uh, it is a ready building or anything after occupation certificate, then it will go outside the goods or service definition. Similarly, purchase of goods from a foreign vendor and selling it out and out to foreign customer. That is also will not be treated as transaction of goods. For example, you as a uh, SSE located in India and you purchase a goods from China, and the goods never brought into India, but before bringing into India directly from China, you deliver the goods to your customer in UK. So what will happen? Your purchase is from China, your sell is to UK, but your goods are never reached in India. If that is a kind of transaction, which we call as out and out supply. If out and out supply is there for the purpose of GST, it is covered in schedule three of section seven. And it will although goods, but not goods for the purpose of GST. So again, this will never be falling under clause number 3, 4, 5 and 6 of the table. Okay. Similarly, purchase by way of a transfer of document in the course of high seas sale. So during the course of import before the good reaches to the customs and if you sell those goods, then that will also be outside the purview of this thing. So those will not be treated as, as your purchases or the sale as the case may be. Then imported goods are kept in the custom bonded warehouse and if you sold the from we from the bond warehouse before clearance for the local consumption then those transactions are also falling in schedule three 
and then there are payment like municipal taxes if you pay to the say bombay municipal corporation you pay your property tax then that is also neither goods nor services by virtue of the uh, powers given in section 72b it is government has notified is neither service nor goods so these are the type few transactions which are neither goods nor services and none of them will appear if you have incurred any expenses for these accounts i am saying expenses means capital revenue both side then it will not find its place in clause number 3 4 5 and 6 or oh, uh, yeah, yeah they, this has been clarified by by icci in para 82.3 of the uh, guidance note so no need to report these in clause number 3 to uh, 7 uh, you however you can include in column 2 is my view but uh, since portal doesn't allow uh, just now ashok bhai stated then it can be excluded with suitable notes yes sir rajiv bhai uh, yeah. there is one that uh, uh, in case of import purchases where igst is paid on imports hmm. it is necessary to show uh, a show report the same under column 7 yes. expenditure relating to entity is not registered hmm. under I, the gst because this may show a large amount and lead to unnecessary queries correct so is is that whether Uh, the import of goods where you pay the igst yeah. uh, they are supposed to be reported in column 7 expenditure unregistered and if yes then it will show a huge figure But, uh, the question is that if there is an import of goods yeah i understood then it is a uh, customs your uh, customs have collected igst on the same yeah okay. so should it yeah. be included in column number 7 that is the first question okay. and then included it will be a huge amount correct correct now oh, this yes. is going to be this is going to be a challenge because what will happen you know the uh, income tax officer who is going to go through this tax audit report perhaps they will not understand gst much uh, they very limited knowledge they may be carrying and that is what we have seen when lot of show cause notices have been issued by service tax department based on the difference of taxable turnover in service tax return income tax return and 26 as so uh, uh, because you, what happens somebody talks english the other is talking french both don't understand each other's communication this is what has happened the same thing is going to happen because uh, we although practicing gst finding it very difficult to interpret and digest the kind of complication and it is very uh, high time to expect such kind of knowledge income tax officer is carrying about the gst so i really uh, appreciate what ashok you are saying that uh in, on import of the goods the vendor is located outside india obviously is not registered and its crores of rupees of goods you may be importing on the taxes are already been paid but if you look at the now this perhaps i am telling you because it is been rolled out for the first time after 4 years and i am sure this clause will go on amendment in next one or two years substantial amendments will come like we have tds reporting in 3cd has undergone a change over a period of time same thing is going to happen and corresponding gst returns also will be changed but as of now the the way the column and the information is sought for in my view although the amount will be huge but still it will go under clause 7 only because it is expenditure of entity but it is from unregistered dealer only the foreign party is never registered it has to find place in column 7 only whenever there is import although the amounts are huge and uh, as a precaution you can i mean to say you can write a notes on a manual this thing import purchases are classified under column 7 although uh, igst on the same is already been collected by the government you can put in a manual report and because in scrutiny or a verification or sometimes you give physical report in any case it is appearing to that extent and those who want to give report qualification and observation in clause 3 of 3ca Uh, i think there also you can give if you want but in my view column it has to come in column 7 only the question further says that can it be avoided reporting and write only a note on it so you don't report it in column number 7 and uh, just write a uh, in the uh, form 3cb clause 5 or 3ca think, clause no i don't think that is a correct way because uh, you, you uh, see any of your expenses are concerned for goods and services either it will be from registered or unregistered it cannot be you toss a coin either it is going to be king and scale it cannot accept surely fine so in this case also your expenses are concerned once you say it is my expenses it has to be either registered or unregistered if you don't report i think that is not a you know at least i will not take that call 
since you are you you are going ahead with writing the note, uh, I think. But uh, prima facie, when the columns are specifically given unregistered and we have clarity, uh, of course, with due respect, that columns are giving some whimsical results. But still, you should my view is concerned, you should put it in the column. Sir, Sumit, yeah, if yeah. I may uh, add one point over here, my yes. knowledge on tax and tax code is quite limited. But yes. uh, if I Taken, there is a place in AIS statement on the income yes. tax portal. Also, you know, data from GST are two way and showing the data to the dealers. Correct. So, it is a, my import details are already contained in AIS as a purchase from registered. Correct. Can we take from that and try to put it in a fashion where the income tax authorities themselves are putting this as a registered purchase in AIS? So, let me put it as a registered purchase only. No, I don't agree, uh, Sumit. For the reason is, uh, for my view is concerned, what is mean by registered entity is the one who is registered for payment of GST. That is the that, that is very clearly defined in the law per se. Now, that why is. income tax AS report is giving those kind of information? First of all, we have no accountability on that, and that is the data uh, given based on the you know analysis or mining done by department. But as an auditor, uh, I can't say that it is a, someone who is not registered and you want to classify as a registered. Uh, will I, be absolutely incorrect to that extent. I'll tell you why I'm uh, taking up the, that question, complementing that by the fact that Section 5.3 or Section 9.3 of IGST Act or Act also correct. designates as the person liable to pay tax on these transactions. Uh, akin to uh, putting in the shoes of the supplier. Correct. Uh, what was the previous regime in service tax also? Correct. So, taking the queue from section 5.3 or section 9.3 of GST Correct. and complemented by this fact that the income tax authorities are classifying this over here under Correct. social clause. Correct. That is where processes came into play, whether it would be appropriate on that. And definitely the clarification will come in the years to come. But for this uh, present year, right now for the next 25 days or so. No, but uh, Sumit, uh, we have a definition of registered person already in 2 sub clause 94. And when we have a definition uh, that you are talking about person liable to pay is different and the column here is talking about relating to entity not registered. Now, registered person is defined. So, one who doesn't fall he will be unregistered only. I don't think your transaction is concerned the vendor is covered within 2 sub clause 94. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, see, let me tell you that uh, uh, if you uh, put a suitable note, there will be clarity to that extent. But at least we are going one step ahead that we are strictly interpreted because if you sum in substance of this table is concerned, whatever expenses, that means inward supply of service and goods are there for you, the government want how much is from registered, how much is from unregistered, within the register, how much is composition and how much is exempt. That is sum and substance they want. It has otherwise though no tax implication whatsoever. Even your column goes here and there. Uh, I am sure assessee will not have a tax it, but it will have consequences later on on the other front. So I, I will take a call other way, but yes, you are free to do it. I have given my view on that. So two sub clause 94 never covers these foreign matters. Sir, what about society maintenance charges? Because hey, society, society maintenance charges are concerned. If society is registered, it will go under registered. If it is not registered, it will go under unregistered. There is no question. It is neither good nor service. It doesn't fall, sir. That no, mutuality, mutuality principle is done away with because Section 7 is amended retrospectively by CGST. So now from 1st July 2017, society and its members are two independent entities. Of course, this matter may be tested over a period of time in the court of law. But as law is amended and at what it stands as on today, the society has to either pay or not to pay, not because it is neither good nor services, that mutuality will not be there. So it will be if your society is not registered, please classify under clause 7. No, well, he has a different point of view. One yeah. second, the different question. Rajiv, I accept. So question is that if a company incurs a society maintenance, yes. society maintenance, some expenses are liable. To Correct. GST, Correct. Or not. Correct. PNL, the whole amount is debited. I mean, Correct. the whole net amount is debited. Correct. So, is it have to split here in clause 44? Yeah. Now, the question is there, uh, sir, can you tell me, uh, I can understand out of 10 items, 4 are taxable, 6 are not taxable. That is what you are trying to say. And society right. has recovered tax on 4. Correct or no? Yes. Yeah. 
yes yeah if that being the case at the end of the day society invoice is concerned it is bearing registration number society is registration number correct sir yes yeah so once it is covered and it is it is bearing the register it is purchased from register dealer so it will definitely not fall under 7 it will because your vendor is registered now within the registration the it will come under which column now that 3 4 5 and 6 so obviously uh, it is related to goods which are exempt then 3 or if it is goods which are other than exempt it will definitely not a composition but other than that so uh, i will put it this way that society which is not paying the taxes on certain transactions there will be some base of it. it they may calling it as an uh, uh, you know uh, expense as a conduit which are pure agent capacity or those kind of stand society must be taking for not paying taxes property the property tax specially is concerned Uh, those kind of transaction land revenue tax on that society may not be paying taxes okay because there is a faq on that part if that being the case and if in my view it will go to the total payment to register entity only i will try to classify an entire amount i will be put it in clause number 6 only to register entity no need to split no need to split only three you have to split it ओनली इन फाइव the goods or services are concerned first of all it is either a mixed supply composite supply as the case may be but it cannot be say that it is exempt service so in my view nothing will come in 3 it will come in 5 only sir what about interest paid and interest paid to others and bank yeah that i am coming to just wait that is there yeah. is an issue on that now the schedule 3 of section 7 and these are the list i th- i am sorry but i have dealt with this and uh, yeah. in my view it will not come in column number 2 it will appear in column number 3 to 7 and clarified in para 82.3 okay with this we'll go to now reporting requirement of 44 and then couple of issues based on that uh, uh, i'll take it up so now the uh, 44 table has a uh, column number 3 4 5 6 uh, two we have dealt is a total expenditure what is column 3 it says that uh, uh, the expenditure in this part of entity registered under gst now those who are registered under gst it has to be further classified into three cl- three columns one is expenditure relating to goods service which are exempt from payment of gst second is expenditure relating to entities falling under composition and third is the expenditure related to other register so with, within the register register entity expenses you have to reclassify under the three club sub clause and total will go into clause number column number 6 that is what the second requirement now here one by one we'll take a column first is expenditure relating to goods or service exempt from gst which is column number 3 now uh, the year what all you need to include is value of all the inward supply of goods or service which are completely exempt from the gst that amount has to be given now the for this you need to know what is the definition of exempted supply which is very very important now that term is we have to be very careful as what we understood exempted under service tax and under gst is completely different so in gst it says that exempt supply means supply of goods service or both which attract nil rate of tax mind well nil rate of tax is also ex- included in exempted supply which was not a case in the erstwhile service tax law it was tax it is taxable but nil rate now nil rate goes to exempted supply that is first thing secondly or which may be fully exempt from tax there are various notifications through with the certain transaction kept outside the purview and thereby the it is completely exempted then that will be also included over here and for that you have to refer notification and those exemptions are given either under section 11 or section 6 6 of igst 11 of the cgst and lastly it also include non taxable supply this is also there will be combination of three things in exempted supply one is a nil rated supply nil rated nil but nil, supply carrying nil rate second is completely exempted and third is a non taxable supply now non taxable supply is also been defined here and which is very important it says that means a supply of goods or service or both 
which is not liable to tax under this act. Now, which are the products which are not liable? I have stated it is by and large petroleum products and alcohol for human consumption. They will be non-taxable supply. Ultimately, non-taxable supply will be treated as exempt supply for the purpose of GST. I hope this is very clear. So, liquor, your uh, uh, the petrol, petroleum products that is oil, diesel, etc. Not oil, but diesel, etc. That will go air, tur air turbine fuel. Those will all be, be non-taxable and they will be going in the exempted supply for the purpose of GST. So, that will find its place in column number three. The next is... Uh, uh, these are the relevant notification uh, from where to find out uh, these. So, thereby, these are the few notifications you need to look into to make out the notification number one and two. These are all the central tax notifications, central notifications are there. Thereby, you will, there the rate of uh, tax is prescribed wherever it is nil that you find out. Notification two is concerned completely, which is exam. Notification 11 is also there and notification 12 is also there. These are the four notifications you need to look into for finding out the exam supply or nil either supply having nil rate. Secondly, I already stated this. These are the two items on which tax is not there. Alcohol uh, for human consumption and petrol, crude, etc. These details you have otherwise when you are filing your monthly GST returns, GST are 3B returns. Then there is a tile 5 of GSTR 3B. And in tile 5, you are already filling up this data. The SSE must have filled up. Let me tell you honestly, many, many or majority of the SSE are not filing this, although it is required when you are required to file Form 3B. But because it has no consequence on the tax liability. So I have found sometimes the data are missing. Sometimes data are entered, but not to the accurate level. We I am talking about my clients are concerned. Why my client, my own data is are also not correct because uh, you get a uh, 20 days time to record GSTR 3B and your books of account with a pen, every penny may not be uh, completely closed by that time. So we do put a data, but it may not be up to accurate level. But as an auditor, you get a clue from here that you have tile file in 3B and that you can download from the portal and you can find out uh, the breakup. But only issue here is concerned. This tile 5 is the combination or total of all three. That is composition supply, exam supply, and nil rated. Now, actually, in this table, they want a breakup. So, again, you will get total. Well, further split is concerned, you will have to obtain from client. And how to obtain the breakup is going to be a big challenge. So, this was just a little clue you can get. I am sure 3B over a period will be uh, modified. And this columns which you are finding here in 3, 4, 5. Perhaps those kind of separate columns also may come in 3B over a period of time. Uh, yeah, Ashoka, anything or shall I proceed next? Uh, there is one uh, query on with regard to builder, but it seems more of a GST query. Okay. Then, asking, then, uh, then Ashok, uh, what we'll do now, today we'll focus on 44. If time permits, we'll take that query. But otherwise, yeah. I have another 10 slides and few issues for 44. Yeah. So let us uh, stick to topic today first. Okay. Yeah. I have no hesitation yeah. in replying to that, but that will be at the end of the session if time permits. Uh, yeah. yeah. So then, first 44, few examples of exempted supply I have given. These are all only illustrative list which you have to add in clause no, uh, column number three, which talks about exam supply. So petrol and diesel expense, by and large, you will have it. Natural gas, aviation, fuel, if you are having it. This is mind well, uh, liquor for human consumption, if at all you are having. Electricity, yes, because it is carrying a nil rate of duty. Uh, license fees and permit, they are exempted. Various license fees you are paying. Municipal water charges, uh, they are concerned as on today. I am not talking about the mineral water because that is taxable, but municipal water charges, yes, it is exempted. Uh, you will have frequently conveyance expenses for yourself or your team member uh, by way of a train fare or maybe air conditioned, other than air conditioned, sorry, metered cab, rickshaw fare, bus fare. Now, here all those things will be means uh, 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 this yellow and black taxi will come, but uh, your Ola and Uber will not come here because they are registered and they are no, as an aggregator, they are already paying taxes. So it will come under registered, but in conveyance, other than that, you'll have auto rickshaws and our yellow black taxi or buses or public transport by and large will come here. Then fine and penalty, fines and penalty, which are prescribed under various law, and if you are making the payment, even these RTO penalties are being there. Then those all will come under this 
uh, toll tax yes there is no it is completely exempted you are you often may be paying that and somebody was asking about interest here is interest interest on bank loan interest on overdraft interest on cash credit interest on bill discounting charges all which are been charged by the financial institutions or banks then only there is a exemption and it is as on today they are not liable to tax uh, this does not include the interest charged by the vendor when the vendor of supplier of goods and services if he is charging the interest on the late payment of your uh, the consideration then that is mind well not exempted it is taxable subject to the rate for which the goods are being supplied or services supplied so i am talking about the last column will be regarding the nbfcs or bank finance related matters sir can sir so these are the few examples of the exempted supply or supply having a, a nil rate of tax or it is a uh but goods which are not covered under gst so this will find in column 3 rajiv bhai yes sir uh, there is one question yes capital work in progress which yes. is capital over 3 4 years it has been incurred and correct. it is capital in the current year correct uh, it be taken in uh, the total uh, total expenditure column or it should be ignored uh see the column 2 talks about expenditure incurred during the year so i will try to say that incur you have incurred over a period of time you are uh, for last say 3 to 5 years uh, uh the entire addition has come in balance sheet of say current year which was otherwise in the work in progress account so you have just passed by journal entry from wip to relevant fixed asset as the case may be so my view in this case is no need to include everything only those portion for which your invoices are pertains to current financial year which is 21 22 and put a suitable note because uh, see all these are concerned we are applying our logic and for the detail but as on today there is no clarification i am again and again telling you ki the tax audit report wants information qua year so we should do everything related to year and that's why this is what is my view for this Yeah. The next is uh, uh, the records and accounts which are not maintained separately for composition dealer. How to deal? Uh, this is the question Ashok sir has sent. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello. Any question? Yeah, one sec. There is one issue. Huh? So capital work in progress will be anyway capitalized to fix assets, right? Yes, yes sir. So yes, sir. No, that's what the question is. So capital saying? expenditure. With regard to which is being transferred from capital work in progress, yes, I said need yeah. not be included to the extent it is for pa of past years. Only the current year's expenditure should be included. That's the answer. Yeah, and uh, gentlemen, uh, you can give suitable note. Huh? In uh, your hard copy of three CD, please put a note uh, that so that it will be rather writing on the representation letter. I'll say. Because these are all disclosure. This entire total forty-four column is for disclosure. So it is better in absence of clarity we make a disclosure to the direction. There is no tax evasion on either GST front or income tax. Uh, the next issue is records and accounts are not maintained separately for composition dealer. How to deal? What is the question? This was sent by Ashok sir. Uh, the, what is trying to say that see the uh, composition dealer if we purchase. goods or service as the case may be from composition dealer uh, the there is a practice followed by majority of the assc that uh, not to write their gst number or not to treat them uh, uh, you know in the financial accounts or in the uh, you know ac accounting software uh, there is separate detail is not available because there is no itc credit available for this okay now the, the question is how to find out that yeah that is going to be a big challenge and it's all depend upon what kind of volume you are having it uh, and how you record your transactions but yes how uh, there cannot be any answer i can give because it's all depend upon assc to assc how to capture uh, the data how to capture that data perhaps i think no speaker can give you answer because every software and every accounting treatment given by the assc or method of accounting followed by them will be also very difficult there can be many issues on that part of it but uh, yes uh, to the best of your ability uh, try to collect the information certified by the client that format guidance note also says that you need to collect the data from client and based on that you put a suitable note i am sure for a small and the medium size uh, tax audits are concerned uh, clients are equally ignorant and they don't have uh, you know total sufficient uh, resources to make these kind of statements honestly let me tell you so it will be going to be a challenge for them 
so i think auditor should uh, write a proper remark assessor has not he can write a note not maintain a recorded expenditure classifying under composition scheme hence we are unable to give details thereof you can put it this way disclaimer straight away if you are not able to and the expenses for purchase goods service from composition are included in the register dealer you can put it this way i have included in register dealer if you can't able to capture it uh, to that extent because they are obviously register dealer to that extent uh, we we have thought of depend upon the volumes we are following these kind of practice if we are able to find out fine otherwise we do follow it and you can also have tile number 5 of 3b whereby details of inward supply for composition dealers are given but of course again it will be a total of all three so those classification will be again a challenge directly uh, yes i don't have any answer to this question honestly because it's all capturing of the data is concerned secondly there is a issue about the prepaid expenses or advance for expenses now prepaid expenses is concerned part of the expense is recorded in pnl and part will be shown as an assets uh, same way advance for expenses now whether whether that is to be recorded or not uh, in my view is concerned it is uh, expenses for next year actually and it will be uh, debited to pnl account of the next year okay but the invoice thereof will come in current year only say let us take insurance the classic example Now insurance say one lakh rupees or one lakh twenty thousand insurance you have paid thirty thousand is for current year and ninety thousand is prepaid. That that simple. The invoice will be of current year only. So if you uh, go by the financial statement, it will show only thirty thousand and balance sheet it will show ninety thousand. My view is concerned. I be I am of the view and we are following this practice, not recording these prepaid expenses in this and total expenditure incurred during the year is because this is not a capital expenditure, mind you. Uh, it is a revenue expenditure but it is not pertain to the year and if you look at a close total amount of expenditure incurred during the year i have incurred during the year I, there is no doubt about it but it is not pertain to the year and the gst returns or gst assessment or even the income tax assessment it is qua year to that extent so i will not include that uh, the prepaid portion in any of this column to that extent with a suitable note i am writing note to that extent uh the next issue is about the uh, ashok bhai is just finished in next 5 minute and then you can ask all the question because i have some four five issues which i'll take it up and then i'll take up your issues if at all you are having uh right. the uh, abc is advocate and who is renting the service to xyz and company whose accounts are to be audited tax audit and abc that advocate has raised the bill mind well on this tax issue paid under reverse charge but that advocate is already registered but he but he has not charged tax on the said invoice see advocate might have taken registration because he must have some other supply say renting supply or some other supply is there that's why he is registered and he has put his registration number on the invoice but he has not charged the tax on it now where to classify these expenses i hope you got the question what i am trying to say so he in this case what will happen where to classify so i will try to put it this way in this example the though tax is payable under rcm because legal lawyers fee liable to be paid under rcm but this particular advocate is already registered for payment of tax although he is not paying tax on this transaction so if your invoice which you are having and if it is having gst number i will try to put it in column number 5 because he is a registered dealer it is expenses incurred for registered dealer although i have paid tax on but in alternatively if the said lawyer is not registered for gst so he has no other income and he has no other revenue except law then it will fall under so it will either go on column number 5 or it will go under column number 7 depend upon the registration of such this same thing will apply for transporters or any other such type of transaction where completely reverse charge mechanism is made applicable transporter will have, will have one more issue because transporter has been given option so the transporter can either opt for forward charge or can opt for reverse charge so you may have come across cases there may be couple of transporter in your client's case where tax is paid under reverse charge couple of transporter they have charge under forward charge so based on the method followed by them your classification will keep changing those who are registered not registered you will have to classify of course challenging job how to classify uh, under category the next is whether reconciliation is required with expenses disclosed in clause number 44 with that of clause number 27 of form number 3cd 
Now, mind well, this form number 20, uh, sorry, clause number 27 of form 3CD is about the ITC, input tax grade. And it only seeks to ask the detail about the ITC opening balance, how much is availed, how much is utilized, and what is the closing balance during the entire year. It has got nothing to do with how much is the inward supply from registered dealer or unregistered dealer or composition. That has never been asked. So it is altogether standalone, separate information for years together. We are giving it. Even in service tax region, we used to give this detail. But whereas 44 clause is concerned, it asks about the expenses, that is inward supply of goods and services related transaction and that classification they want. So there is no need to reconcile also between those two. Both are independent clauses are concerned and information envisage under both the clauses completely different. Next is clause number 44 reporting requirement expenditure related to registered entity. So the something which doesn't fall under three and four and if it is still from the registered entity it has to bound to be fall under five. So find out totally how much is from registered dealer first filter at three and four and balance will come under five. So all the registered dealer whether he has charged you tax he is not charged, although liable, or other than exempted and other than uh, composition, everything come under clause number five. And total thereof will go in clause number six, which will be a three, four, five, six, it will be the total of registered transaction. Now, the seventh clause is concerned is an expenditure relating to entities not registered under GST. This is what is URD in the old regime under VAT, we used to call a URD purchase. So here is also same URD expenditure. Now here all those transactions will come even including that import we have discussed about. And because of the portal, Ashok Bhai has very clarified that the two is concerned, six plus seven should be always two. Otherwise portal doesn't allow you to upload uh, your GST, uh, sorry, tax audit report. So <laughs> seven will be very clear on that. So unregistered portion will come over here. Now one more issue. In table, column 2 is arithmetic total of 6 and 7. In my view, it was no. But unless portal, because the portal doesn't allow. Otherwise, if you interpret the thing, the total expenditure, in my view, include also depreciation and all. So I have given a view, no, it should not be. But our institute guidance note says, yes, it has to be because of the portals working. 6 plus 7 is equal to 2. Otherwise, not the case. Let us wait for clarification on that. But right now, portal, you have... No choice but to make it ensure 6 plus 7 is equal to 2. So for the one which you are not included in 2, those expenditure you have to give by way of a note and disclosure that these are not considered in entire table. Now, other important aspects of this is reporting under clause number 44 is required to be given on consolidated basis. So that means if you have got 3 branch, 5 branches, so it will be multiple branches and you may be consolidating. So whether it is to be given branch wise, so what it says, yet it has to be given entity wise. So the purpose, possibly suppose you are doing tax auditor of a company which has got a offices in 10 different states and registration in 10 different states and there will be 10 branches. So every branch is concerned, you'll have to consolidate and you have to give one audit report only. Uh, and I've been told that portal doesn't allow you to file branch wise audit report. It will be consolidated. So the detail also has to go consolidated only. And our institute has suggested that as a auditor, we should collect this information from the client in the prescribed format. The format is given over here, which I have narrated. This is uh, there in the institute guidance note, page 259. You can find this clause appearing over there. I think uh, looks very simple only on paper, but uh, reality, uh, I don't think the small or medium entity will have, unless and until you have accounting software to take care of these kind of this thing, it will be very, very Hercules task to have this kind of a classification with a great accuracy. Uh, what about the disclosure? So if SSE is not in a position to give the detail as required in clause number 44, because basically it is SSE whose job is to compile the information as an auditor, you need to certify or verify and certify. Uh, so you need to give appropriate disclosure or disclo uh, disclaimer as the case may be in your audit report. Now, I have just given a few of the notes which you can give. So you can write total expenditure disclosed in column two includes capital expenditure incurred during there. That please give it. Uh, it is also advisable to give separate column for revenue expenditure and second for a capital expenditure. That you can really very much give it in this case. Uh, uh, that is one. 
the secondly the total expenditure disclosed in column 2 includes revenue expenditure claim for expenses provision for expenses etc that was another note but now i think when 6 plus 7 is equal to 2 this note may not work to that extent you have to modify this thing uh, because we are not able to take depreciation and uh, loss on sale of assets etc in column 2 just to match that 6 plus 7 turnout should be 2 so suitably you need to uh, amend this column uh, the notes the third is above information is based on the details, data and records maintained by the SSE. We have verified the same on test basis. The accounting software used by SSE is not configured to generate the report data as required to be given in the table here in above. Considering the above fact, it is not possible for us to vary, verify the uh, certify the correctness of the classification of the expenditure given in the table. We can give this because even on a test, base, test check basis, but you should prima facie be satisfied that what system is followed by the SSE while writing the accounts and classification. I am sure in majority of the small and medium SSE, you will have a challenging time. So you set a suitably, you can put a note. I have given the wordings, uh, this thing. Well, friends, now if you can have any issues, we can take up the issues. Ashok Bhai. Yeah, Rajiv Bhai, uh, with yeah. regard to issue number 10. Issue number uh, 10. Yeah, so the reconciliation of clause 27 uh, and the ITC, Yes. Uh, problem is that uh, uh, the ITC will require the entire registered dealer ITC which you have. Correct. So if you don't reconcile it, sometimes it might give a very bad mismatch, which huh. the officer then ask you. So uh, uh, we are telling our clients to reconcile it. Uh, that is the differentiation between uh, the view which I have. So oh, fine. I will I will try to put in one thing. There are various transactions on which your vendor has charged you GST, but your uh, ITC to that extent is a restricted. Okay, one thing yeah. is that maybe a block credit. There may be a proportionate reversal. So what will happen is suppose uh, you have taken ten thousand rupees of ITC, and at the end of the year you have some proportionate reversal comes of two thousand rupees. There, there may be some of the other registered dealer from where you purchase the goods or service on that GST spread, but those are falling into block ITC. So they, what will happen is your this mismatch in my view is going to come uh, uh, irrespective of the efforts you are going to put. In my view, ITC is a certain ITC client has ignored, not taken, missed out or time has lapsed. All those things also may be there. Sometimes there is a dicey situation whether to take ITC or no. So in that case, they are not taken. That doesn't mean that transaction is not from registered dealer. So these kind of difference will be there. If you are making the efforts of reconciliation, fine. But I will only try to say that how far it will help you out, sir. Because this 44, 44 clause is concerned, I am repeatedly saying it will have no effect whatsoever on your GST liability as well as on your income tax liability as on today. Unless we have some such clause of disallowance of expenditure, which may be introduced over a period of time in income tax, that's fine. Sir, one more thing. Someone has raised a question about uh, this uh, consumption. How do you deal with, because consumption has opening stock, purchases and then less closing stock. Correct. So with that, how do you deal with this uh, in your for, clause 44? Fine. So that is basically in trading account, instead of purchase, you will have a direct consumption taking care of your opening stock and closing stock both. Correct. So now my issue is concerned that consumption has nothing to do with this table. Uh, what is important is your purchase a figure. You need to give the figure of purchase only because that is the expenditure you have incurred for purchasing your goods or service as the case may be. So consumption, I will even, even if your financial statement shows consumption, uh, they will also be showing the figures of purchase also. No? Opening stock plus purchase minus closing stock. So purchase figure will be already there. So in my view, in column number two, and as well as the classification further in column three, four, five, or seven, as the case may be, should be that of purchase and not of consumption. Uh, there is one question, assessing uh, which comes under tax audit report only because of uh, loss or future and option, uh, option transactions. Correct. Then this clause is applicable. I think you covered this, but... Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I think uh, if those are the kind of tax audit, there may not be many expenditure on the debit side. Then you may not have many columns to fill also, sir. But uh, in any case, whatever limited expenditure, you will have to fill. 44 clause is not optional. It is mandatory under whichever section your accounts are audited for tax audit purpose. What is the penalty if I nail by for some reason it's nail fine? Nay, nay. Uh, you, uh, uh, gentlemen, clause number 44, you can't write nil, sir. Let me tell you honestly, because you have expenditure of assessee, okay, you are certifying his PNL balance sheet as the case may be. So, you know, there is an expenditure. Only thing you don't have a information or proper breakup available. Okay, so you can write note key, I have not been provided with this, etc. But you can't write bills. Hey, that is what he is saying. Disclaimer if it is given, there is no consequence. Ha, so, whether there will be no penalty, right? No consequence. Hey, uh, sir, this uh, uh, this tax audit report, when it is used by income tax officer, when tax audits were introduced in 85, that time what they have stated that uh, you that it will ease the process of assessment. Sir, ji sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, pro, the why tax audit was introduced? Because uh, it will smoothen the assessment. Okay. And the form was introduced because the uh, officer will have uh, information on his platter. And basically for facilitating the assessments. Okay. Now this GST, whether it is registered or unregistered, show me there is a which is a clause in income tax whereby where you have purchased the goods or service from unregistered dealer or composition dealer, there is no deduction. Anything and everything related to business, you get a deduction. Correct, sir? Only thing you have to prove it is for the purpose of business. So this particular 44 clause is to my knowledge as on today is a data mining. But to start with, no, like service tax was introduced only on three services. It was only one page return. But now where it has reached to, we have got indirect as GST with 18 lakh crore kind of revenue per year. We have reached to only from GST. Correct. So this way, this clause 44 also is concerned. Maybe five years down the line, we'll have multiple columns and it will be synchronized with the GSTR 3B also. As on today, there is no consequence in income tax to my yeah, that is why he's asking. So, if yeah. you give disclaimer, that, first that yeah, we also we can't give disclaimer. Yeah, so yeah. 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 And particularly, <laughs> it has come in between. Uh, yes. Also yes. Given now. yes. 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 What, what about pure agent? Where it will hey, come? Hey, sir, a pure agent is concerned. It is a concept in in, in GST whereby. The expenses incurred by pure agent on B of his customer is not forming part of the valuation. That's all. So uh, that means what happened if you are providing some services, okay, uh, and you recover certain expenses in a capacity of pure agent, you have to exclude that only for valuation. That there, there will not be any problem whatsoever because that person is always a registered person. So it will fall under registered dealer only, sir. So it will call under column number uh, five only. And this is nothing to do with ITC that we have taken during the year, right? Nothing no, to do with nothing, ITC. Nothing. Your input tax rate, uh, I think I have dealt with, this is there in clause yeah. number 27, which you are otherwise also doing. Even last year also you have filed that 27 clause, correct? So what I understand is these all details are to be captured from books of account. Many people are asking whether can you get the, all these details from the uh, returns filed under GST. Uh, some detail you can get, but I have already explained you the tile number 5 of 3B, but that gives a consolidated figure, uh, which is a total of 3 and 4. So again, oh, 3 or 4 ka breakup kaise lenge? See, because right. uh, it will give exempted and composition, all those together. So again, you require a breakup. So books of account will be required and then which software is being used and how the command, rather the classification is done in writing accounts. That will only help you. And I'm sure uh, for this first year, no, 21, 22, majority of the RCC has not done is my experience. Yeah. So in case of builder, yeah, the, the project is completed, but two Correct. situations. Some Correct. flats remain to be sold. Correct. Uh, the first situation. Second is no stock. The for, firm continues. Correct. The clause. 10% will be applicable for non-GST expenses also? That 10% is 20%, eh? first of all. For builder, it is 20%. Yeah, 20%. Ah, so there is no 10% over there. And it is a 10% only for the construction services provided. Now, in your case, when there is no activity, there is no question of that 20%. That is one part of it. Because there is no output supply which is taxable in your case. And secondly, when the ready flat is there, 
uh, you are selling it is some stock so that is i presume it is post occupation certificate correct so then also yeah. that 20% will not be applicable right uh, yeah sir uh, in case of uh, you know certain expenses where the set off is not allowed and yeah. the top is are not maintained for example uh, food and beverages correct so that expense may be to uh, register dealers but you know the, the proper records are not maintained yes so, yes uh, i will uh, give you i will give you sir small example the issue is concerned forget about others my own office see my office boy is concerned uh, they give me voucher once in a month okay now we pay them uh, cash up front on day one and uh, they keep spending and only one voucher it is only for convenience okay now entire month he may be going here and there which he include traveling and postal and court fees and stamp paper and food beverages what not all okay now he give me one voucher with small small wherever supporting is available not available all those thing now you tell me uh, one voucher will have 10 20 supporting okay or maybe sometime more how i am going to classify we, we we how it is possible so what we do we classify the head of account it will include postal stamp also courier also court fee also conveyance also tea coffee also and what not okay so this problem challenge is yes it is there now what to do so i have classify that as unregistered dealer in my own case only actually it is not unregistered dealer let me tell you because there are some of the vouchers which are registered dealer hotel bills are there so uh, now i have no answer to what your question is because i myself for my own office i have no such system how to maintain um, and i can't ask to keep on recording small small daily voucher with him so this is what happen with many companies their salesmen will be there the salesmen get, get their voucher get settled once in a week or month or quarter fortnight as the case may be and there will be a lot of supporting now which company is maintaining this kind of thing i don't think the biggest of the company will find it very easy to maintain correct no sir Yes, yes, agreed, sir. Ah, so I, uh, 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 let me tell you, uh, giving lecture is very easy, but practically this solution cannot be implemented. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, that's uh, we pay custom duty to the CHA. Correct. And CHA pays the amount to the government. Correct. Now, expenditure. Where do you show that? Yeah, customs duty is concerned. First of all, it is a uh, custom duty is a taxes. It's a levy on the goods which are being imported. so obviously it is an expenditure there is no doubt about it but it is neither for goods nor for services okay the, because then there is no vendor to that extent there is no supply coming up the custom duty is paid on the import front when you are importing the goods so it is made it's a levy by the government under the customs act so in my view it will not fall anywhere in the cross uh, table and we are writing a notes that we have not included that in this table 